Hello class and welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 19, Endocrine and Hematologic Emergencies. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand the significance and characteristics of diabetes, sickle cell disease, clotting disorder, and the complications associated with each. Students should be able to demonstrate knowledge of the characteristics of type 1 and type 2 diabetes and be able to list appropriate steps for assessment and pre-hospital treatment of diabetic emergencies. You will also be able to discuss hematologic emergencies and describe sickle cell disease, hemophilia, thrombophilia, and deep vein thrombosis. Okay, so the human endocrine system directly or indirectly influences nearly every cell, organ, body function. The endocrine disorders are often seen with a multiple um, of signs and symptoms. Hematologic emergencies are difficult to assess and treat in the pre-hospital setting, and your actions may save a patient's life. So the anatomy and physiology of the endocrine system is a communication system that controls functions inside the body. Endocrine glands excrete messenger hormones, and uh, the hormones are chemical substances produced by that gland. They travel through blood to end organ, tissues, or cells that they affect. When they arrive, the message is received and an action takes place. Endocrine disorders are caused by an internal communication problem. If a gland is not functioning normally, it may produce either more hormones, which is uh, hypersecretion than needed, or not enough hormones, which is hyposecretion. And um, a gland may be functioning correctly, but the receiving organ may not always respond. And so we're gonna talk first about glucose metabolism. So, of course, the brain needs two things to survive glucose and oxygen. And insulin is necessary for the glucose to enter the cells. It's like the key that unlocks the cell door. Without enough insulin, the cells do not get fed. They do not get the glucose. And so the pancreas produces and stores two hormones, glucagon and insulin. The islets of Langerham are found in a small portion of the pancreas. And within these islets are alpha and beta cells. See, the alpha cells produce uh, glucagon, and the beta cells produce insulin. And the pancreas stores and secretes insulin and glucagon in response to levels of glucose in the blood. And so a little bit about the pathophysiology of diabetes. So diabetes mellitus is a disorder of glucose metabolism, and that is the definition at the core. I'm going to repeat that once again. Diabetes mellitus is a disorder of glucose metabolism in such that the body's impaired uh, the ability to get glucose into the cells to be used for energy. It affects about 9.3% of the population. Without treatment, glucose levels become high, and in severe cases, they may cause life-threatening illnesses or coma and death. If not managed well, it can have severe complications, um, such as blindness or cardiovascular disease, uh, kidney function problems. And there are three types of diabetes. Um, so there's diabetes mellitus, which is uh, type, two, type 1, diabetes mellitus type 2, and then there's a pregnancy-induced uh, pregnancy gestational diabetes. Treatments for diabetics um, include medications and injectable hormones that lower the blood glucose level. So if administered correctly or incorrectly, it can create a medical emergency for the patient with diabetes. Low blood glucose levels, which is hypoglycemia, uh, if unrecognized and untreated, can be life-threatening. You must also recognize the signs and symptoms of both high glucose levels and low glucose levels. So high glucose levels are, named, um, are called hyperglycemia, and it can result in coma or death. If treatment uh, exceeds a patient's need, it can cause a life-threatening state of hypoglycemia. Uh, 
All right, so hypoglycemia, like I said, is low blood glucose levels. Um, both hyper and hypoglycemia can occur with both diabetes mellitus 1 and 2. And uh, you will encounter many patients uh, displaying signs and symptoms of both high and low blood glucose levels. Hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can be quite similar in their presentation. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the presentation. So patients can uh, present with altered mental status in both, and they can often mimic uh, alcohol intoxication or intoxicated patients often do have um, abnormal sugar levels. And so, all right. So with hypoglycemia, um, this can develop if a person takes his or her medication but fails to eat enough food. And if a person takes too much medication, it results in low blood glucose levels despite a normal dietary intake. Okay? And so all hypoglycemic patients require prompt transport. Oral glucose paste um, can be administered if they are alert and able to protect their own airway. Injection of glucose, which is sugar, um, or glucagon, um, can be given by an advanced life support provider. Okay, and so let's start talking about the different types of diabetes. So we have diabetes mellitus type 1. And this is an autoimmune disorder in which the immune system produces antibodies against the pancreatic beta cells. And so missing these pancreatic uh, hormone uh, insulin. And without insulin, glucose, like I said, it cannot enter the cell and the cell cannot produce energy. And so basically, um, it's, it's a, a simple autoimmune disorder in which the immune system produces uh, antibodies against the pancreas. Onset usually happens in early childhood through the fourth decade of life. And so the immune system destroys the ability of the pancreas to produce that insulin. The patient must obtain insulin from an external source. And patients uh, with type 1 diabetes, they can't survive without it, right? And so they have, um, they inject insulin often, and they need to check blood sugar levels, um, sometimes up to six times or more a day. Many people with type 1 diabetes have an implanted insulin pump. And so what this does is it continuously measures glucose levels and it will provide insulin at correct doses uh, based on the carbohydrate intake at meal times. And it, it limits uh, the number of times a patient has to check uh, their sugar levels. And, but it, they can malfunction and diabetic emergencies can also develop. So always inquire about the presence of an insulin pump and ask if it is working properly. Okay. Uh, the type 1 diabetic is the most common metabolic disease of childhood, and a patient with a new onset of type 1 diabetics, diabetes will have symptoms relating to eating and drinking. And so the symptoms that they're going to have is polyuria, uh, polydipsnia, polyphagia, weight loss, and fatigue. And when the patient's blood glucose level is above normal, the kidney's filtration system becomes overwhelmed and glucose will spill into the urine. And a result of this are those um, symptoms that we talked about on the last slide. And uh, they're going to have polyuria. And what is polyuria is uh, frequent urination. So frequent is the poly aspect of that word and urea uh, is urination. And then the next one down is polydipsnia. And polydipsnia is poly, of course, increase, and dipsia, fluid consumption. And then you'll have polyphagia. And poly, um, increase, uh, phagia, severe hunger or food intake. And so when you have the type uh, 1 diabetic, uh, glucose, when it's unavailable to the cells, the body turns to burning fat. So when the body turns to burning fat rather than glucose, it produces acid waste, and that is ketones. Um, as ketones level go up in the blood, they spill into the urine, and um, uh, kidneys become saturated with glucose and ketones and cannot maintain an acid-base balance in the body. So the patient breathes faster and deeper as the body attempts to reduce the acid levels by releasing more carbon dioxide into the lungs. And so what happens is this they form Cushmol respirations. Um, 
we're going to talk about Cushmal respirations a little bit later in this uh, slide presentation. And so if fat metabolism and ketone production continue, a life-threatening uh, illness called diabetic ketoacidosis can develop. And DKA for short, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA for short, may present as generalized illness along with they could have uh, abdominal pain, body aches, nausea, vomiting, or an altered uh, level of consciousness or unconsciousness if severe. If not rapidly recognized and treated, DKA can result in death. When a patient with DKA has an altered mental status, you need to ask the family or friends about the patient's history and uh, presentation. So obtain a glucose level as soon as possible with a finger stick using a lancet and a glucometer. And generally, their blood sugar levels are going to be higher than 400 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so next we're going to talk about diabetes mellitus type 2. And this is caused by a resistance to the effects of insulin at the cellular level. There's an association between obesity and increased resistance to the effects of insulin. And so the pancreas produces more insulin to make up for the increased levels of blood sugar and dysfunction of cellular insulin receptors. This response becomes inefficient and the blood glucose levels continue to rise and do not respond with the pancreas uh, when the pancreas secretes the insulin, a process called insulin resistance. And so insulin resistance uh, can sometimes be improved with exercise and uh, dietary modification. And what you're going to see is these are the uh, patients who are uh, older. So this is a uh, formed over their lifetime uh, because of this uh, um, uh, increased uh, need for their body to produce insulin because of increased levels of blood sugar uh, in their body. Oral medications used to treat type 2, di type two diabetes. In some cases, um, uh, the, the, medic the medications that could be used uh, increase secretion of insulin and pose a high risk of hypoglycemic reaction. And um, some of them stimulate receptors for insulin. Others decrease the effect of glucagon and decrease the release of glucose stored in the liver. And some of them, uh, in, uh, injectable medications and insulin are also used for type 2 diabetes. Okay. So often diagnosed at a yearly medical exam from complaints related to high blood sugar levels, including reoccurring infections, changes in vision, and numbness in the feet. Symptomatic hyperglycemia occurs when blood sugar levels are very high. The patient is in a state of altered mental status resulting from several combined problems. And so when you get hyper uh, symptomatic hyperglycemia uh, in type 1 diabetics. Um, this leads to ketoacidosis with dehydration from excessive urination. Okay, and in type 2 diabetes, they uh, this leads to non-ketonic hypersmolar state of dehydration due to the discharge of fluids from all of the body systems and eventually out through the kidneys, leading to a fluid imbalance. If an individual is hyperglycemic for a protracted length of time, consequences of diabetes may present. And so what happens is wounds do not heal, numbness in hands and feet, they can, uh, blindness occurs, renal failure, or gastric motility problems. When blood sugar levels are not controlled in, in diabetes mellitus type 2, a condition known as hyposomolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome, which is HHNS, uh, can develop. And key signs and symptoms of HHNS include hyperglycemia, altered mental status, drowsy or lethargy, severe dehydration, thirst, dark urine, visual or sensory de deficits, um, partial paralysis or muscle weakness, and often seizures. 
higher sugar levels in the blood cause the excretion of glucose in the urine. And patients respond by resulting in their fluid intake, which causes the polyuria. Um, in HHNS, the patient cannot drink enough fluid to keep up with the exceedingly high glucose levels in the blood. So the urine becomes dark and concentrated. The patient may become unconscious or a seizure activity due or have seizure activity due to severe dehydration. Symptomatic hypoglycemia. And so um, having symptoms related to the hypoglycemia, an acute emergency in which a patient's blood sugar levels drop and must be corrected swiftly. So this can occur in patients who inject insulin or use oral medications that stimulate the pancreas to produce more insulin. And so when insulin levels remain high, glucose is rapidly taken out of the blood. If the glucose levels fall, there may be an insufficient amount of uh, sugar to supply the brain. mental status of the patient declines and he or she may become aggressive or display unusual behavior. Unconsciousness and permanent brain damage can quickly follow. Common reasons for low blood sugar uh, can um, develop from, um, so they could use the correct dose of insulin with a change in their routine. So let's say that they, uh, the patient uh, exercises more and consumes a mere meal maybe later or skips a meal. Um, they, um, hypoglycemia can occur maybe if they use more insulin than, they, uh, than necessary or correct dose of insulin, but uh, they do not eat a significant amount, sufficient amount. Or they could have the correct dose of insulin, insulin and the patient has developed some type of illness. Hypoglycemia develops much more quickly than hyperglycemia, and in some cases, it can occur in a matter of minutes. Okay, so now that we know what hyper and hypo is, we're going to talk about um, signs and symptoms relating to both. And so they present very differently. When you have hypoglycemia, um, you're going to, usually going to have normal to shallow or rapid respirations. The skin is uh, going to be pale, moist uh, skin. They're going to have diaphoresis. They're going to have dizziness, a headache, a rapid pulse, or normal to low blood sugar. Okay. And so um, altered mental status, anxiety or combative behavior, seizures, fainting, or coma, weakness on one side of the body. This can mimic the stroke. Uh, symptoms, remember? So, and rapid changes in mental status. Here's a slide that shows um, the hypoglycemia um, uh, levels, and uh, it can be quickly reversed by giving the patient some sugar. Without the sugar, however, the patient can sustain permanent brain damage. Um, minutes count. Right now, we're going to start talking about the treatment of, okay? So, a uh, patient assessment of diabetes, uh, the scene size up. So evaluate scene safety and ensure all hazards are addressed. Uh, be careful of the presence of syringes used by the patient for their uh, insulin injections. Be alert for clues such as insulin bottles or plates of food, glasses of orange juice that may help you decide what is possibly wrong with the patient. So use standard precautions question bystanders on events leading to your arrival, and keep open the possibility that trauma may have occurred secondary to the uh, low blood sugar or high blood sugar event. So determine the mechanism of injury or illness. So your primary assessment, you're going to form that general assessment. So how does this patient look? Um, are they anxious, restless, or listless? Um, are they irritable? Are they acting appropriately with their environment or interacting appropriately? Um, identify life threats and provide life-saving interventions, so particularly airway management. And so develop that level of consciousness using the AVPU scale. If unresponsive, you can suspect the patient has diabetes. So you need to call for advanced life support. A uh, patient may have also have undiagnosed diabetes, so don't forget that. And if the patient is altered of mental status, assess sugar levels um, if you're allowed to and you have the proper equipment. So perform C-spine and mobilization when necessary and perform rapid transport. Remember, always carry out a thorough, careful 
primary assessment, paying attention to the ABCs. Um, assess the airway and breathing. So patients showing signs of inadequate breathing, you could use a pulse ox level um, to evaluate. And if it's 94% or less or altered mental status, they should always receive high flow O2. So remember high flow O2 is 12 to 15 um, liters per minute via a non-rebreather mask. Hyperglycemic patients may have rapid, deep, Cushmol respirations, and uh, those uh, they might have a sweet, fruity breath. Hypoglycemic patients will have normal or shallow or rapid respirations. So if the patient's not breathing at all or is having difficulty breathing, all, um, as with always, we open the airway. We could support. We could insert an aero, airway adjunct, administer O2, uh, assist ventilations if uh, if they are unconscious, and continue to monitor the ventilations throughout the patient care. And next is the C. So we're going to um, assess the patient's circulatory status. Are they is the skin dry, warm skin, which is usually the hyperglycemic? or moist pale skin, which is the hypoglycemic. So that's a big determining factor when you're looking at signs and symptoms. Remember dry, hyper, moist, hypo. And then the re, uh, rapid weak pulse is uh, symptomatic hypoglycemia. So rapid weak pulses is associated with hypoglycemia. And then your transport decision. So any patients with an altered mental status or an inability to swallow should be transported properly. Patients uh, capable of swallowing and conscious enough to maintain their own airway may be further evaluated on scene and uh, interventions can be performed. Next is a history taking and uh, so you should investigate the chief complaint. Obtain a history of the present illness from responsive patients, family, or bystanders. Responsive diabetic patients um, will know usually what is wrong. So if the patient has eaten but not taken their insulin, hyperglycemia is more likely. If the patient uh, has taken the insulin but has not eaten, hypoglycemia is more likely. So observe physical signs and symptoms to determine whether the patient is hyper or hypoglycemic. Obtain a sample history from the responsive patient or a family member or bystander. So for a known diabetic, you could ask questions such as, did you take your insulin or do you take insulin or pills? Do you wear an insulin pump? Is it working properly? Have you taken your insulin uh, the usual dose today? Have you eaten normally today? Have you had any illness, unusual amount of activity or stress? You could look for emergency medical identification devices such as the wallet, card, necklace, or bracelet. And then your secondary assessment. And so your physical examination, assess unresponsive patients from head to toe with the secondary assessment of the entire body. So you're looking for clues about the patient's condition. Be alert for any secondary illness or injury, as we mentioned before, which is the trauma due to um, the altered level of consciousness. So when you suspect diabetes uh, is a relate the problem, focus on the mental assessment. Do they have the ability to swallow and the ability to protect their own airway? And then also we're going to obtain a glass calcoma score. Vital signs you should take, including blood sugar levels, um, using a glucometer if available and protocols allow. So overall, hypoglycemia respirations are going to be normal or rapid. Pulse is going to be weak or rapid. The skin is going to be pale, clammy with low blood sugar or low blood pressure. Hyper, hyperglycemic patients, you're going to have respirations that are deep and rapid. Pulse may be rapid and weak and thready. Skin is going to be warm and dry with a normal blood pressure. Okay, so hypo, you're going to have that uh, pale, cold, diaphoretic, hyper, warm and dry. All right, so a portable glucometer. You need to study the operator's manual um, for which one you're going to use in the field. Just know the upper and lower ranges for the one that you have and um, be able to identify that normal, non-fasting, adult and child sugar levels should range between 80 to 120. Neonates should be above 70. So 80 to 120. Okay, 
reassessments. You're going to reassess the patient with diabetes frequently because they uh, can um, occur, um, changes can occur. So has their uh, mental status improved? Are the ABC still intact? Have the, is a patient reacting to interventions which we're performing? And how must you adjust your change um, or change the intervention? So based on administration of glucose or um, glucometer readings, or a deteriorating level of consciousness, you might have to adjust the interventions. So provide the indicated interventions. For hypoglycemic conscious patients who can swallow without the risk of aspiration, aspiration is inhalation of a substance. So they must be conscious and have the ability to swallow. You must um, administer uh, or encourage the patient to take glucose tablets, if available, or drink some type of orange juice containing sugar um, or orange drink. Administer gel um, or a sugar drink if local protocols permit and provide rapid transport to the hospital. For unconscious hypoglycemic patients or patients with the risk of aspiration, interventions include an IV, um, or an IM, which is an intramuscular injection, or intranasal or glucon, or glucagon, which is needed. So which most EMTs are not able to do. So an advanced EMT or paramedic can start an IV and administer some glucose. Um, if in doubt whether the patient is symptomatic, hyperglycemia, or hypoglycemia, most protocols will err on the side of giving glucose. So when in doubt, just consult medical control. Determine blood glucose levels in a patient with diagnosed diabetes can be difficult when signs and symptoms are confusing and you have no way to test the blood sugar. Um, so in these situations, perform a thorough assessment and contact the hospital to help sort out the signs and symptoms. Coordinate communication and documentation. So inform the receiving facility about the patient's history, present situation, your findings, and the interventions, and the results of those interventions. So patients who refuse transport because their symptoms improve after taking sugar may uh, require even more thorough documentation. So emergency care for diabetic emergencies includes giving oral glucose. So there are three types of oral glucose pre preparations available commercially. So there's the rapidly dissolving gels, there's large chewable tablets, and then there's uh, a liquid type of uh, formulas. The only uh, contra indications for oral glucose are the ability to swallow and unconsciousness. So um, remember, aspiration can occur. So while you're administering this, wear gloves before putting anything in a patient's mouth, follow local protocols for the administration, and reassess the patient frequently. So you may see a rapid response to your treatment, or you may also see a rapid deterioration. Okay, next, we're going to talk about the presentation of hypoglycemia. So you can have uh, seizures. Seizures may occur and they should be uh, considered very serious. Uh, even if the patient has a history of chronic seizures, uh, you could also have possible other causes that is ca causes that is causing the hypoglycemic event relating to the seizure. So it could be caused from infections or poisoning, um, obviously hypoglycemia, some type of trauma, decreased levels of oxygen or uh, idiopathic, which is an unknown cause, um, fever of the seizure uh, in children, and undiagnosed epilepsy in children. Also, um, though brief seizures are not harmful, they may indicate a potentially life-threatening underlying condition. And so make sure that you manage the patient's airway and that it's clear. Place the patient on his or her side if there is a possibility, uh, if there's no cervical spine. Um, uh, injury. Do not place anything in the patient's mouth. Have uh, suctioning equipment ready. And if the patient is cyanotic or appears to be breathing inadequately, provide oxygen or artificial ventilation transport properly. Altered mental status treatment may be also from other conditions, uh, such as a poisoning or head injury, a postictal state, or decreased perfusion to the brain. So it may be caused by complications of the diabetes. So it could be caused by altered mental status, hypoglycemia, or ketoacidosis. 
you could use the mnemonic uh, AEIO tips, uh, which we talked about in the last chapter, and always suspect and check for low blood sugar in the patient with an altered mental status. Ensure the airway is clear, provide uh, artificial ventilations if needed, and be prepared to suction if the patient vomits and prompt transport. Misdiagnosis of a neurological dysfunction. It's usually patients with a diabetic emergencies are thought to be intoxicated. So it could be um, misdiagnosed as a, um, some type of uh, neurologic dysfunction. A diabetic patient's um, confirmed by police is at risk. So an emergency medical identification bracelet, necklace, or card may help identify that situation. So a blood sugar test performed at scene, um, if protocols allow, or an e emergency um, room will help identify a problem. So be alert to the potential for diabetics and alcoholics to coexist in the same patient. So relationship to airway management. So may not have a gag reflex or vomit, so carefully monitor the airway, place a patient in the left lateral recumbent position, and make sure that you have the suction available. Okay, so next we're going to start talking about the hematologic emergencies, and hematology is the study of blood-related diseases. There are three diseases three disorders that can create a pre-hospital emergency. So sickle cell disease, hemophilia A, and thrombophilia. And so we're going to talk about the anatomy and physiology of these of, he, of the hematologic emergency. So blood is made up of four components. We have the erythrocytes, leukocytes, platelets, and plasma. And so each of these components of the blood serve a purpose in maintaining the body's homeostatic balance. Um, they transport oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of the cells' uh, tissues. And so red blood cells, which are the red blood cells or erythrocytes, contain hemoglobin, and which carries oxygen to the tissues. Red blood cells make up 40%, 42 to 47% of the blood volume. And so then there's the white blood cells or leukocytes, and they make up 0.1 to 0. 2% of the blood cell volume, and they collect dead cells, provide for their correct disposal, and they respond to infection. Then you have platelets, which make up uh, 4 to 7% of the person's blood cell volume, and they're essential for clot formation. They respond to blood, to skin and blood vessel damage, and they assist in forming clot um, to stop bleeding. And then there's the plasma. The plasma is a transportation medium for the blood components, proteins, and minerals. We're going to talk about sickle cell disease, and it's also called hemoglobulin S disease. It's an inherited blood disorder that affects red blood cells. It's found predominantly in people of African, Caribbean, and South American ancestry. It also presents, but it's less common in Mediterranean and Middle Eastern people. All preborns or newborns in the United States are tested for sickle cell disease shortly after birth. People with sickle cell disease must, um, they have misshapen red blood cells that can lead to dysfunction in oxygen binding and unintentional clot formation. So clots will result in a blockage known as a vasoocclusive crisis. It can result in hypoxia, pain, and organ damage. Sickled cells have a short lifespan, resulting in more cellular waste products in the bloodstream and contributing to sludging, which is a clumping of the blood. Maintaining hydration is very important, and insufficient, insufficient hydration leads to increased clumping. Complications associated with sickle cell disease include anemia, gallstones, jaundice, and spleen dysfunction. Vascular occlusion with ischemia can include uh, acute chest syndromes, um, and those syndromes have uh, hypoxia, dyspnea, chest discomfort, or fever, and um, could uh, cause stroke or joint necrosis, pain crises, acute and chronic organ dysfunction, and retinal uh, hemorrhages or increased risk of infections. 
Many of these complications are very painful and potentially life-threatening. The patient is also more susceptible of two infections. So clotting disorders, we're going to talk about next. And clotting disorders or hemophilia are very rare. Only about 20,000 Americans have this disorder. And hemophilia A affects mostly males. People with hemophilia A have an increased um, or a decreased ability to create a clot after an injury, which can be life-threatening. Patients with hemophilia A typically have IV factor 8 replacement infusions, which help the blood clot, either close, uh, either close at hand or with them. Common complications of hemophilia A include long-term joint problems that may require joint replacement, bleeding in the brain, or inner cerebral hemorrhage, thrombosis due to uh, treatment. Okay, and the exact opposite of hemophilia is thrombophilia. It's a disorder in the body's ability to maintain a smooth flow of blood through the venous and arterial systems. The concentration of particular elements in the blood creates clogging or blockage issues. Thrombophilia is a general term for many different conditions that result from the blood clotting more easily than normal. And so it could be uh, inherited, which are genetic disorders, medications or other factors, or patients with cancer. So clots can spontaneously develop in the blood of the patient. And so the next clotting disorder we're going to talk about is a deep vein thrombosis. You're going to see it and hear it written as DVT. It's a common medical problem in uh, sediment, sedimentary patients and patients who have had a recent injury or surgery. And so you may encounter several methods to prevent blood clotting formation, which uh, are they include um, blood thinning medications, compression stockings, or mechanical devices. And so the risk factors, like we mentioned on the previous slide, include recent history of a joint replacement and um, complaints of leg swelling, um, travelers stuck on travelers or truck and long distance bus drivers, or bedroom patients in nursing homes. The treatment for this, the DVTs, is an anticoagulation therapy, and um, it's an in-hospital IV medication, um, which could be all the way from IV medication to an oral medication, um, and self-administer subcutaneous injections or oral medications, or oral medications are typically administered for at least three months after diagnosis of a DVT. Patients prescribed medications to treat DVTs are at an increased risk of bleeding complications, especially gastrointestinal bleeding, and minor trauma is more likely to produce severe internal and external hemorrhaging. So just understand that if they're on pit medications for DVTs, um, a clot from a DVT can also travel uh, from the patient's lower extremities to the lungs, causing a pulmonary emboli. Pulmonary emboli can cause chest pain, difficulty breathing, or sudden cardiac arrest. And so when we talk about um, patients and assessments of the hematologic disorders, um, we're going to run through that. And so, of course, the first thing you're going to do is ensure scene safety. Most sickle cell patients will have had the crisis before. Just uh, wear gloves and eye protection and determine the number of patients involved. Be alert for trauma and consider advanced life support if needed. Is the patient in any pain of African uh, American or Mediterranean descent? And if yes, um, have they been uh, undiagnosed? Are they undiagnosed? So perform a C-spine if necessary. Form general impression. Is the patient anxious? Uh, is the patient irritable? Determine the level of consciousness. Assess for the A and the B. So the patient uh, with ad inadequate breathing or altered um, mental status, make sure that you give them high flow O2. Patients with a, who are experiencing sickle cell crisis, they may have increased respirations and exhibit signs of pneumonia. For patients with difficulty breathing, open the airway, you put in an adjunct if needed, and administer oxygen um, by assisting ventilation. Assess the patient's circulatory status next. So sickle cell crisis patients will have an increased heart rate um, because it's, uh, the blood is being forced, the sickled cells are being forced. So for suspected hemophilia patients, just be alert for blood loss. Um, 
note the origin of the blood or if there's bleeding of an unknown origin, um, so blood in the urine or stool. So be alert for hypoxia, which is due to the blood loss, and make a transport decision. Transport to the emergency room um, is always recommended with patients who are experiencing sickle cell or hemophilia. The history taking, so be a, um, obtain a history of the present illness, and res, uh, you could get that from a responsive patient, of course, or patient's family um, or the bystanders, and be alert for physical signs indicating some type of sickle cell crisis. So um, you could see swelling in the fingers and toes, priapism, uh, or jaundice. You should ask the following questions. Is pain associated, um, or is it isolated to a single location or throughout the body? Is the patient having visual disturbances? Is the patient experiencing nausea, vomiting, or abdominal cramping? And is the patient experiencing chest pain or shortness of breath? Obtain the sample history from the responsive patient or um, get it from a family member and um, ask them, have you ever had a crisis before? When was the last time you had a crisis? And how did the last crisis resolve? Have you had any illness or unusual amount of acti activity or stress lately? The secondary assessment, you wanna do a systematic exam of the patient Focus on the major joints at which the cells could um, conjugate. Evaluate and document mental status using that AFPU scale. Obtain a complete set of vitals, including oxygen saturation. So normal sickle cell crisis vital signs will be, they'll have normal to rapid respirations, weak rapid pulse, pale clammy skin, and a low blood pressure. Use a pulse ox if available to monitor the saturation. Readings may be inaccurate, though, due to the uh, patient's anemic state. We want to reassess vital signs frequently to determine changes in the patient's condition. And um, ask yourself, are there changes in the mental status as well? And are the ABCs intact? How is the patient responding to the interventions that we're performing? So adjust or change the interventions as needed and document each assessment your findings and the time of your findings, the change, also the change in the patient's condition. So administer O2 via non-rebreather mask um, to compensate for the decreased cellular oxygenation related to the sickle cell or the hemophilia. Hospital care for sickle cell crisis includes giving pain, um, penicillin, IV hydration, and uh, blood infusion. Also, uh, they treat the hypotension and transfusion of plasma. So you need to communicate with hospital staff for uh, care and document clearly. Emergency care is mainly supportive and uh, systematic with um, hematologic disorders. So for patients with inadequate breathing and altered mental status, we're giving them O2, putting them in the position of comfort and transporting them rapidly. Okay, now we're to the review section of this chapter. So I'm going to let you continue uh, and complete this on your own. And thank you uh, for, for joining us for Chapter 19, Endocrine and Hematologic Emergencies.